about this if it was right now in the 80s and you know you have some kind of aspiring band you'd have to go to an expensive recording studio to record your music and then probably push your cd out into a cd store and hopefully some people would actually walk into the store and buy your cd there and then finally play it on their you know old-fashioned cd players right <laughs> nowadays you can actually be an aspiring musician somewhere let's say you know in in africa get you know a very basic setup uh, with you know some free audio editing software, record your music there, upload it into MySpace, and somebody on the other side of the globe in a matter of minutes can actually download it onto their iPod and play the song. So there's a lot has changed in terms of the amount of uh, music content that is available online now compared to 10, let's say 20 years ago. And so this is actually one of the examples here to compare, for example, with um, Netflix, um, which is. Um, a uh, video streaming service which has a catalog of probably about a hundred thousand uh, videos if you compare that with the music data that is nowadays available then we're actually talking about orders of magnitude more data going from you know a catalog of probably about a million songs with Pandora to catalogs of over 10 million songs um, with known services like iTunes or Spotify or RDO and if you would go on to MySpace we're talking about another multiple of that of music content that is available and every day, lots of content gets uploaded to this, gets added. And so the question here is, is really like, you know, given this huge pool of data that's available out there, which would take us hundreds of years to listen to each single one, uh, each single song, so we could never listen to all of it, how could we actually find the content from that large pool of data to listen to on our personal music players? Right, without ending up with listening to the same song over and over again. Because of course, if that's what you want to do, it's pretty easily possible. You just turn on the radio, or even you know, generate a Pandora radio station, which some of you may have noticed that after a couple days, sometimes you know, songs start coming back. Point is here that what's happening is that you know, a lot of um, the um, services that used to play music to us, especially more than 10 years ago, would actually mine music from a very small set of songs and they would play them over and over again. And that's called the short head. It's, it's basically a small set of songs that just get played all the time. But one thing that gets forgotten that way is that there's actually millions of songs and unknown artists out there that are basically just not played whatsoever, but a lot of us may be interested in hearing them. We just don't know they exist. Right? And that is really the focus of this research, like how can we get these songs out there, right? And so Pandora certainly makes a step in that direction, but again, as I said, um, one of the issues that they have is that their catalog is probably only about a million songs right now. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. What we really want to do is we want to mine all the songs that are out there, which is probably above 100 million songs as we speak, and bring them out there certain to the users, so that they're not always kind of listening to Britney Spears on the radio, right? <laughs> That's kind of like the motivation that we have. So the question is, how do we do that? How do we find the right music for somebody um, that, for example, maybe working out in the gym and would like to listen to some happy rock and roll? Or let's say you come home from a date, 
you don't have the time to go dive into your CD collection or whatever other source of music you may think about to find some romantic jazz music. You know, what you would like to do is you would just like to tell a system, give me romantic jazz and it starts playing. Because <laughs> you don't really know an artist name or a song title that would be appropriate. Or on Halloween night, let's say you just want to have some scary Halloween music to play outside your house, but you have no clue what would be an appropriate artist or song title. This is really the problem, right? And so especially maybe like, you know, in some of these cases, you may know some sort of song, song titles or artist names, but even then, very often you'd like to listen to some new music that you don't know what the artist uh, name may be or the song title. So that's really the idea here. So how do we do this? Or for example, another uh, kind of situation could be that you, say you have like a little playlist that you always listen to when you go work out. Instead, what you would like to have is a much bigger playlist of maybe a couple hundred songs that are similar to those songs that you could be using for working out. The problem is, again, you don't really know which other songs that are out there that are similar to these songs, or at least you can't directly find an artist name or a song title to, for example, um, you know, buy their albums and add those to your playlist. So how do we do this? What we need for this is basically some kind of black box that will automate the anal analysis of the millions of songs out there. Okay. And so one of the things one could do is one could think about building a black box that can automatically tag music with all kinds of tags, including genre tags, mood tags, instrument tags, usage tags, etc., etc. So the idea here would be that given a song, now instead of having a human listen to this song, we have this black box, the computer listen to that song, and then this black box is able to tell us which tags in these categories here are most applicable to that song, i.e. to that waveform. For example, here in this case, we'll be talking about a dance song that is romantic with some piano and with for dating, right? And for another song, this will look differently. We built such a system, and in fact, what the system does is it listens to a waveform that it has never heard before, just like a human would listen. Fly me to the moon. <laughs> So basically, we feed this waveform into the system, and this is what comes out of it. What comes out of it is a bunch of tags, which are these blue words here. What we did is we poured them into like you know this black matlib here, which is just a standardized textual format in which we can then plug in the most likely genres, the most likely instruments, etc., etc., to obtain some kind of simple summary of the music. Okay. Now here again, in this case, the computer had never seen this song before. We feed the waveform into the computer, and this is the description that it comes up with. You know, it comes up with words like jazzy, count, calming, sad. It also comes up with some words that may not necessarily be entirely um, applicable, like for example, acoustic guitar, there's not much acoustic guitar in here. There are some errors. But on the other hand, if we were to feed it with a song like this one, so then it comes up with a description where it says something like dance, hip hop, um, exciting, good to play at a party versus this one is maybe good to play to, to play when hanging with friends, which is a little bit calmer, etc., etc. The bottom line here is is that both of these songs were never heard by the computer before. The only thing we did is we feed the waveform into it, and this is the description the computer comes up with. Nothing is perfect, but clearly, this description is certainly more applicable to this song, and this description would clearly be associated by everybody with this song if we were to were be asked uh, to match them up with the right songs, right? That kind of like shows us at least that you know building a system like this is not really completely impossible. But again, we will make some mistakes also because you know when humans would have to do this, they would make certain mistakes as well. But anyway, so that's the idea here. So the idea is given a song, can we build a black box that can automatically tag it with appropriate um, natural language tags? And so if we do this now for let's say the millions of songs that are out there on MySpace, then what you end up with is some annotated or indexed database of songs, millions of songs by, let's say, a couple thousand tags here. And then you can use that database to address the problems that we were talking about before, right? So for example, if you're looking for happy rock for the gym, then you can basically select those songs from the database that have been tagged with those tags and use those songs to build a playlist or a radio station. Right, that's one way to go. The other way to go may be that, you know, you want to feed the system, oh, okay, I didn't know this slide was coming up, but so basically this is just a quick example here that we're not only talking about this at the lab, but we're actually also doing it all the way up to the front end. So one of the things that some of the undergraduate students at the lab build is actually a music search engine where you can enter a bunch of tags in a little search box here, like for example, romantic jazz and saxophone, and then what happens is that as a result, um, you get a list of songs that are romantic jazz songs uh, with saxophone in them. Okay, and you also get like little descriptions of the songs and things like that. 
Um, but so this is the kind of functionality that I tried to explain in this previous slide here. We're given you know, a semantic query. We can now build playlists um, of songs that are um, relevant for uh, the tag in the search query. Okay. The other thing you could do is you could actually say like, well, what if I don't really want to describe what I want to listen to with words, but I want to describe what I want to listen to with other songs. For example, I want to feed my search engine with a query song, right? And now I want the computer to generate a playlist of songs that are similar to that song. But you can actually use the same database for that because you could look up that song in the database, right? You could look at which tags are applicable to that song and then recommend other songs that have similar tags associated with them and generate a playlist in that way. Okay, we also implemented a, a front-end for that, which is the Marco Volney radio, which is actually a uh, radio station that, that Brian created, who uh, Vaslav was just talking about. And so basically what happens here is that you feed it with a couple of songs, and then it starts recommending more and more songs in the radio station that are similar to these songs, but in a way that is entirely based on analysis of the waveform. And the reason why I'm saying this is because there are different services out there, of course, uh, as we talked about before, that are um, looking into music recommendation, like, for example, Pandora. But the way that they defer, uh, that, that their approaches are different from, from what we do, is that in the case of Pandora, they actually have an army of um, musical experts sitting down at their computers, ripping apart CDs and listening to songs to manually annotate them. So they do the same thing as what we do, but the difference is that while we are doing it with a computer, they are building that index database with humans, which is one of the reasons why their database is not as big yet as of present as, for example, iTunes database or our Geo database of songs. I don't know the exact number, but as far as I know, Pandora nowadays has a library of about a million songs. Okay, also one of the things with Pandora is that if you want to see the system, you have to provide an artist name or a song title. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to play that song for you, but that's the song that they're going to see at least the radio station with, and then they're going to play similar music to you. So you have to know an artist's name or a song title to start off that radio station. Another service that's out there is iTunes Genius. So basically the idea there is, is you upload a song to Genius, and what it'll do is it'll return you a bunch of songs that are similar to that seed song, which is basically similar to the Marco Volno radio, Marco Volno radio that we developed. But the difference here is the following. Let's say that tonight you go into your garage, you record a song there, right? Put it on your computer, upload it into Genius, because you want to look whether there's other songs out there that are similar to that song. What's going to happen is this. It's basically going to tell you that it cannot find any similar songs, any other recommendations. Now, why is that? Well, I don't know why it is exactly, because Apple never tells what they exactly do. But what we suspect is what Genius does is they apply a technique which is known as collaborative filtering. And now, what is collaborative filtering? Well, collaborative filtering is a recommendation strategy where you use, you where you look at how the items that you're trying to recommend have been used by a massive amount of users. For example, Amazon does something like that as well. Like when you check out, it'll tell you that other people who bought the books that you just bought also bought these other books, right? Genius is trying to do something similar, but using sales records and playlists of all the subscribers they have. Okay. So the idea here is, is you have this huge matrix of you know, millions of users of iTunes by you know, millions of, of songs they have in their library. And what they do is they collect some type of feedback from these users, which could be explicit in, in terms of star ratings, or which could be implicit most of the time it's that, by just knowing that the user has played the song in their playlist or the user has bought the song. Right? And the way the recommendation then works is that given a song, you basically look at which users have bought this song or have highly rated this song, and then what you will do is you will recommend other songs that have also been bought or have also been played by those users. And in the end, this is really like, you know, the golden standard for recommendation, right? If two songs have been played by, you know, let's say 100,000 listeners in common, right? Then you can be pretty sure that they're two songs that fit very well together in a playlist. And the problem very often is, that for a lot of songs in this matrix here, that the column is actually empty, meaning there is just no data in there because people have never bought the song or never put it in a playlist because they don't know about the song. Right? I don't know whether you know that, but like for example, I think in iTunes, it's probably about half a percent of their catalog that is responsible for roughly 80% of their sales. And I'm not sure about the numbers, but I think it's anywhere between 70 and 80% of the songs that just never sell a single copy. So we're talking about you know 80% of these columns being pretty much empty here, and therefore 
Again, I don't know exactly how they do it with Genius. The point is if you upload unknown sound into Genius, you're not going to get anything out of it. How can you address this problem? Well, the way to address this is by saying, well, we're not going to look at sales records, but we're going to build a computer system that actually looks at the waveform of the music, that actually listens to the music like a human would do, right? And then use that analysis to make recommendations. And of course, the waveform is available for any song, whether it's known or unknown, right? So basically, that's kind of like the story about Genius. So what we do is, how does that contrast with what Genius and Pandora does? Well, in our case, we do the annotation automatically, so not by humans. We also allow people to look by specifying what they're looking for with natural language words. Pandora, in principle, we do that, but they don't seem to do it. And I think the reason why they probably don't want to do it is because if they would allow it, people could reverse engineer their database, right? That may be one of the reasons. But anyway, so we allow people to look um, by natural language query, or we also allow people to use some type of genius mechanism where they upload one or more C songs and we recommend them similar songs exclusively by analyzing the waveform of the songs. Okay, and as it turns out, in fact, a couple of years ago we did a little um, comparison between the playlists that are generated by our system and Genius's system on songs that Genius could make recommendations on. And as it turns out, um, the people that did the survey, the playlist survey that we have built upon that, they voted the both systems as being equally competitive. The one condition was that we had to hide the artist names and the song titles so that they actually were listening to the music because otherwise, of course, in the case of Genius's recommendations, just by recommending similar artists, people would look at the recommendations and vote the playlist with most of similar artists in there as being the one that's more relevant, right? But otherwise, those systems were fine equally competitive, which is a very stimulating result in terms of <coughs> using waveform analysis to make uh, music recommendations versus collaborative filtering, right? Okay, so now how does this work? Well, the way this works is um, by using machine learning and signal processing. So basically what we do is, in order to make this box intelligent, we show it a bunch of example songs that are associated with a given tag. For example, for the tag rock, we show it, let's say, a thousand rock songs, and then our machine learning algorithm will somehow try to figure out what are the typical acoustic patterns that keep reoccurring in these rock songs, and will associate that pattern with rock. And then if some future new song that it has never seen before and has that same blue pattern in it, then the system will decide that this is a good example of a rock song and index it that way. Okay, so this is how it works at a higher level. Now at a slightly lower level, how does this work? There's many different ways of making this work, by the way. We're not the only ones that are doing research on this, so what I'm telling you now is just a example. It's not necessarily the best example, it's also not the worst way of doing this. Uh, this was one of the first ways of how people started doing this um, four or five years ago. Given a uh, training set of songs associated with a tag, so let's say let's given a thousand songs that are associated with the tag rock, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, estimate a statistical model. We're going to estimate a distribution of acoustic features that are commonly associated with this tag rock. That's what we're going to try to do. So what does this mean? Well, what this means is the following. Let's just start looking at an individual song, just for starters. So this is my song here, right? So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to take that song and I'm going to chop it into little pieces. Each of these pieces is probably about 50 milliseconds or something like that. A bit longer, a bit shorter. Doesn't really matter. From each of these pieces, we will extract some information. We could extract information related to the timbre, to the harmony, to all kind of um, information that's available in this little piece. Very often, this will be related to some type of spectral analysis, for example, extracting mel uh, frequency capsule coefficients and their derivatives. There are several options for this. I'm not going to go into more detail right now about this, but so what we do is from each little piece here, we extract some information and we represent this information in some <coughs> high dimensional feature space. All right? And we do this with every little piece here. So as a result of that, the whole song now is represented as a cloud of green dots in some high dimensional audio acoustic feature space, right? And so the next thing that we're going to do is now we're going to try to characterize the shape of this cloud of points by some statistical model, whatever it is. So what we have now is we have some statistical model here that describes the acoustic content of this song. Okay? That's the approach we're taking. Now, of course, we're not interested in songs. What we're interested in is tags, right? We're interested in the statistical model that describes the acoustic content of songs that are commonly associated with a certain tag. Okay, so what we're doing now is we're looking at all songs that have been associated with the tag rock in some training data set. We're throwing all these points together, 
So for each of these sounds, we can extract the green cloud, right? Throwing all these green clouds together, and we're doing the same thing again. We're modeling the shape of this cloud with some statistical model. And this is now the statistical model of the acoustic content that is commonly associated with the tag, in this case, rock. Okay. That's what we're doing. Now we can do this for rock, we can do this for hip hop, romantic, jazz, driving, romancing, whatever you want to do. In the end, we end up with a big portfolio of models that characterize each of these tags. All right. So now given a new song that the computer has never heard before, what the computer will do is first it will chop the song into little pieces, extract features from each of these little pieces to represent this song also as a cloud, and then we can look at which of these models explains the cloud best. Right? And by doing a little bit of Bayesian analysis, in the end, we end up with some kind of relevance measure for each of the tags that we have in our dictionary based on how well the corresponding model describes the cloud of points extracted from this new sum. Question? How did you pick 15 milliseconds? Yeah, so, okay, the 50 milliseconds <coughs> is, I would say, plus or minus 30, so it could be 20, it could be 100. Um, the reason why we picked it to have roughly that length is because that's what people in speech recognition usually pick. Um, again, this is five, six years ago when we started working on this. Also, you want that, that number is somehow a trade-off between it not being too short, because you have to be able to extract some information, so you need to kind of like have a little bit of you know, time behavior in that little piece. If it becomes too short, there's like you know, no time information in there anymore. If you make it too long, then you know the signal becomes non-stationary over the very long time frame, and you're just averaging, you're extracting an average feature over let's say two or three seconds, which then you know doesn't pick up on the very specific details of the of the waveform anymore. But the short answer to your question is it's mostly trial and error. People in speech have been doing this for decades, working with MFCCs, and that's kind of like the lengths that they have mostly settled on, the ones that are most useful to extract rich information from the signal. Answer your question? Yeah, I do realize that was a standard. It's, I mean, yeah, it's not, it's, 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 yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, it's like a standard practice that has shown over, you know, years that it extracts useful information. But it's a good question because if you really, if you make it too long, you're just extracting, you're not picking up on specific details in the signal. Like, you know, there may be like, you know, a bass hit for a drum or like some, something that really happened in a short amount of time. And if you make it too short, then you're just extracting noise because you want some averaging to happen, right? Over a certain amount of time. Question? Yeah, do you have overlap of the segments? Yes, we do. Okay. We overlap. I didn't talk about that, but that's one of the technical details that it's correct. Yeah. Question? 50 milliseconds sounds like it'd be too short to get information about tempo. Yeah, yeah, very good question. I'm going to get there in a second. <laughs> Thanks for introducing my next slide. <laughs> okay, let me give you the answer, actually. I'll immediately go there. So. Um, <coughs> Okay, so this is just an example here, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers song. We have a, a dictionary of probably about two, three hundred words here that are in different categories, including instruments, genres, emotions, and things like that. And you can see, like, you know, you send the song through the annotation system and it comes back with, you know, what we call a semantic multinomial, which is basically a weighting over all the times in our dictionary as to how applicable they are to the song. But anyway, so I want to get to your question now. So basically, because these bits that we have here are only 50 milliseconds long, there are certain things that they do not capture. And in fact, to make the case even worse, describing a song in this way is not going to capture anything that plays itself out over one or two seconds. In fact, it's going to mess it up entirely. And the reason why it messes it up entirely is because of the following. Let's say that I take the same song as the one that I started from, right? But let's say that I permute all these 50 millisecond bits now, right? So I'm going to do this. Now this thing is not going to sound like much anymore. But the green cloud here is still identical, right? It doesn't, the shape of this cloud does not depend on the order of these bits here, right? So as a result, the way that I'm describing the song or the way that I could potentially be building tag models is insensitive to the order of these 50 millisecond segments. Or turning it around, the models that we're building right now are not modeling temporal phenomena that play themselves out over more than 50 milliseconds. So how do we deal with that? So one of the ways uh, to deal with that is saying like, well, instead of building models that just look at these 50 millisecond segments here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue, let's say, 200 of those together into a 10 second chunk of music. And I'm going to model, build a statistical model of this 10 second chunk rather than these 50 millisecond segments. Now, how do we do this? Well, one way you could do this is by modeling this uh, 10 second chunk as a sample 
from a temporal model, for example, a dynamic texture model, or also called Kalman filter, or also called linear dynamic system. Right? So basically, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a model that is characterized by these equations here. Basically, it's a model that has a hidden state variable here that varies over time according to a linear equation, and that is what characterizes some type of temporal dynamics in the music signal. And then for every point in time, we observe a specific timbre harmonical component or something like that that is modeled by this observation variable y here that is the output variable of our system. So this somehow is similar to hidden Markov models, but the big difference is that the state variable here is continuous. The reason why we did it this way is because hidden Markov models are used a lot for speech, as some of you may know. But in speech, it's fairly natural to assume that there's something like phonemes that we use to produce speech, and there's only a discrete number of them, roughly. For music, it wasn't so uh, clear that um, there was just a discrete number of musical phonemes, so we decided to go with a system that has a continuous state variable. That was the reason why we did that. Now, one thing here, if you're trying to model a song like this, it may not be enough to have one linear dynamical system to explain every 10 second segment, right? Because a guitar solo may have a different temporal dynamics than an intro or an outro, right? So what we did is we decided to model these songs with mixtures of these models. So what I mean with that is we're modeling a song with something that looks like this. So what is this? This looks come from very far away like a Gaussian mixture model, you know, like a statistical model with like several blobs with means and variances and stuff like that. But from close by, if you look at this, what this, what this actually is, it's a mixture model of Kalman filters. And what we're basically trying to do now is we're trying to say that this model here generates this song in the bottom in such a way that every 10 second segment of this song is mostly generated by one of these four Kalman filters, by one of these four mixture components. Okay, and so for example, in the intro of the song, it may be mainly the green Kalman filter that is generating the temporal dynamics that we're observing, while here, you know, into the verse or the chorus, it will be another mixture component that is generating the musical content, and so on and so on. So the short story here is, is that by using these models, we allow to take into account temporal information over more than 50 millisecond segments. And building models for song, and of course, if you can build models for song, we can also build models for tag using this. What's interesting with this is actually, if you try to fit these type of models on songs, but in a fairly natural way, the segmentation of the song comes out. And this was something that we didn't primarily, we were not primarily looking for, but it turned out that this model actually allowed to do that. By just saying like, let's fit this song with a mixture model of four Kalman filters. If you then, after fitting the model, look at which 10 <coughs> second segments are generated by which mixture components here, it actually turns out that they don't vary too wildly as a function of time, and they're actually naturally segmenting the song minus a little bit of post-processing. The question is that there is overlapping uh, instrument and vocal at the same time. How do you model deal with that? Yeah, so this is, it's a, this is a completely data-driven approach. So it'll just model that as a whole. So it's not splitting it up into pieces. So we're not doing any like ICA or source separation or anything like that at this point. So, so anyways, you know, given this type of model for songs, you can now also use this to build models for tags, like for example, for the tag electric guitar, you collect all the songs that are, have been annotated with electric guitar and you do a similar type of process as we talked about before. The only reason for this slide is to tell you that it's actually a bit more complicated than it sounds. If you're trying to fit models that are a bit more complicated, like this one's here, on a lot of data. So there's all kinds of algorithms that are working on the back end to make this work for hundreds of thousands of songs. I'm not going to go into detail about that. Question? How do you define the distance measure between the common filters? Um, but can you frame your question? Like, I mean, I understand what you're asking. The answer is scale divergence, but... Right. So, so basically, uh, when you match one song versus uh, this model, you have to define some distance metric between this uh, song's features and versus this uh, Yeah, you just style. evaluate the likelihood under all the different models. But one of the ways that you can do it efficiently is you take the song that you know, is being fed into the system, you model it with a mixture of Kalman filters, and then you compute KL divergence between these models. Okay. But you have to do it with sampling methods because you can't do it exact anymore. So let's go back to the drawing table now. So basically, what did we need to do? We needed to collect some thousand of rock songs, right? Model all these songs with the models that I just talked about, and then we're in business. 
Um, and of course, do this not only for rock, but for a whole bunch of other tags as well. Now, how do we get these examples? How do we get these 1,000 rock songs? How do we get these 1,000 happy songs, dating songs, and things like that? The first approach that we tried to follow to get those was survey methods, basically Pandora techniques. Now, our Pandora uh, people were not musical experts that um, lived in the Bay Area, so to speak, <laughs> without further comments. Um, but what we did is we resorted to uh, undergraduate students from the music department. <laughs> <laughs> and they did a great job. So. But still, the problem is that if you want to do this for, let's, we did this for 500 songs, and this led to a data set that's actually fairly broadly used now. But if you want to extend this to, let's say, 1,000 or 10,000 songs, then it's going to cost you a lot more effort to coordinate a lot more students and also a lot more money. So at that point, we decided, like, okay, if we want to keep pushing this forward, we're not going to be able to scale this approach. So instead, what we did is we designed this um, online game in Facebook, which is called Heard It. It's <laughs> okay. What, what's interesting about this, I have to give you one uh, disclosure here up front, which is that 85% of the people that were involved in designing this were engineers. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. I mean, I know that the interface is not like you know, the most polished thing out there, but like for a bunch of engineers generating something like this, I think, you know. But so what we basically wanted to do is we wanted to take a crowdsourcing or human computation approach where the idea is that instead of having people play solitaire for hours, have them, play, have, have them have fun playing our game, and maybe by doing that, they can provide us with some useful data. Right? I mean, there's other crowdsourcing approaches out there, like Mechanical Turk, where instead of trying to seduce people with something that's fun, you're trying to seduce them by paying them with these micropayments, right? Anyway, so the idea here is there's a song playing, there's a bunch of people in the same room that are all logged, all logged into Facebook, and basically what they do is they listen to a song, and while the song is playing, there's like a little game that plays in the middle of the screen here that is related to tagging that song. And so, for example, what could happen is that there's a certain song playing, and then you get a bunch of tags here, that, um, let's see what happens now. Um, example, a bunch of tags that are related to genres. And so basically, the user, what the user will do is that the user will click on the tag that they think is most applicable to the song, and after they do that, what will happen is that the system will provide them with feedback as to what other people clicked on. And the more they agree with what other people voted on, the higher score they get. Okay. Now for genre tags, this may not be like the most exciting thing to do, but as soon as you try to start throwing tags in there, like romancing and dating and things like that, People actually really like to see what their friends, friends vote on and stuff like that. So as a result of, of, of launching this game, it was actually not so hard to get you know, somewhere close to 10,000 players registered for this and collect tags from, I think, at present, roughly about 150,000 rounds of games, which certainly pushed our data set far beyond what we had previously collected from these undergraduate students. So this certainly was a success story in, 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 in that respect. Now, looking at the numbers, or looking at this in a little bit uh, more detail here, so as soon as we collect data from this game, right, let's say, for example, a thousand good examples of rock songs, what we do is we feed that into our black box to train it to recognize rock songs, and then that will feed our search engine, right? Now, one thing that we wanted to do is we just wanted to make sure that we were making sense here, and so in order to just check that we were making sense is we trained two black boxes, one based on our game data, and the other black box was trained on Pandora data. Now, it is true that Pandora doesn't give out their data, but there is some ways to mine it from the internet. There are some tags that are available through some of the web pages that they have up for some of the artists which do contain some of the tags. So what we did is we mined some of the Pandora data, trained two parallel systems with that, and then evaluated one against the other. And as it turned out, so the, the green line up here is pretty much like you know the expert best possible performance that you may um, expect, which is you know the performance of the system trained on Pandora data. And then the horizontal axis here is, is time, right? So this is when we launched Herd, and this is as time went by. And this again is performance here, with this being our target performance, roughly. And so you can see as time goes by that the uh, performance of the system trained on the herded data creeps up and gets very close to the performance of the expert trained data, uh, the expert trained system, which is the validation that we were looking for. Now there's something interesting to be said about this though, because if we're going to use the game to provide data to train these machine learning models here, then we may as well do the opposite as well. We may as well use the machine learning models that we have at any point in time, right? and use those to improve the quality of the games. 
Because if I'm going to generate a game here, for example, that has no vocals in the soundtrack that is playing, and the question that's being asked is whether the vocals are male or female, then people are not going to like playing it, right? So, as it turns out, but well, that's one thing you can do. The second thing is also that you can somehow try to evaluate which models are doing well and which ones are bad, and then kind of like design games that are directed towards those tags that you really need more examples from, right? So once we started doing that, it actually turned out that as a function of time now, again, from left to right here, the performance of the herded system improved towards the expert performance roughly twice as fast. I'm not going into detail here of how we exactly did this active learning, but so really what it boils down to is that we have to look at the machine learning models that we have at any point in time, look at where they fail, and then try to collect more data there through the game. You play a couple more games, you train your models, and you do the same thing again, and you keep going back and forth. And by doing that actively, you can now train your uh, models much more efficiently with less human effort as a function of time um, to get the expert performance. So bottom line here is that taking this uh, herded approach was a very interesting experience. In fact, what's interesting about it as well is that when you integrate a game into Facebook, <coughs> at least at the time, now it is getting harder and harder, but you can also extract demographic information from your players. And so you can find out some information as to, you know, what do the, let's say, you know, the higher age categories think about rock and roll music versus the lower age categories, what do different demographic things about it, and things like that. Something interesting that we found out by kind of mining that data is that when you ask females whether a song is danceable or not, you find a very high level of agreement. So it seems like they have quite a sense of what's danceable or not. <laughs> <laughs> you already guess what the next statement is, right? <laughs> so yeah, we checked the males as well, and that was just one big uniform distribution. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so the point I'm trying to make here is that what's interesting about having a game in Herdit is that you can extract some demographic information and as a result of that, you can actually personalize this box here and you can build acoustic models for rock music that are now tied to specific demographic subgroups as well. This is something that we're in the process of doing, so I don't really have any um, specific examples of that yet, but that's certainly something that Herdit um, allows us to do. All right, so where are we at now? At this point, where we're at is that given, so we basically build a system that given millions of songs allows us to index these songs with natural language words, and we can then use that to build a semantic search engine, right? For example, there is a lot of other things we can do with that. As I said before, if instead of feeding the system with a natural language query, we want to feed it with some example song and then create a radio station from that, and we can easily do that by simply matching the tags of the seed song against the tags of other songs in the database and generate the radio station that way. Now, one of the things you may wonder about at this point is like, well, why, and I get that's exactly what I want to say, <laughs> just double checking. Um, so why would I tag a song and then look at similar tags to build this radio station. If I have the waveforms available anyways, why not just doing the matching in the waveform domain and not worry about tagging them? You know, why introduce extra noise in the process potentially? Now, the reason for that is that actually, not only in uh, music information retrieval, but also in computer vision and some other fields, it turns out that matching low-level features, like for example, low-level features and images, to make similar recommendations is often found to be not as robust and not as performant than when you first take the images, extract some high-level concepts like tags from these images, and then match the tags. And we tried this out for music, and that was actually the case for music as well. I, by just simply matching you know, low-level audio content in the music was not giving us as good of a playlist as when we would extract tags and then match tags. Right? However, what you could do, though, is you could say, like, well, sure, okay, there's a problem there, but it may be possible to train a computer system, a machine learning system, to actually pick up specifically on those elements in the waveform that are important to recommend similar songs and ignore other stuff. Because if you're just matching waveforms, you're not doing any of that. You're just kind of like extracting audio content and then measuring distances between these vectors, and that doesn't work as well, then, you know, working with tag similarity. But what if we can build a machine learning system that actually learns to pick up on the important components in the waveform to assess similarity and ignore all the rest. 
And so then we thought like, okay, let's try to see what we can do here. So let's try to learn a distance metric between audio clips that is based on audio content, but in some intelligent way. Let's try to do some learning such that the similarity recommendations that we get out of this are actually better than just doing raw audio feature matching. So first thing you have to do there is you have to extract some audio information from these songs. So given the song, what we're doing is we're extracting similar type of features in a similar way as what I was talking about before. And in fact, in this case here, what we're also doing is we're gonna kind of cluster all these features a little bit by using um, some vector quantization so that every song is represented by some code word histogram over a thousand um, code words. And every code word is some kind of like representative audio feature, right? This type of approach is kind of randomly picked. I mean, there are some reasons why we took this approach, but there are certainly other approaches to extract audio features from songs that could be used here. This is just an example. The only thing that we're interested in here is if I extract some audio information from these songs, is there a way that I can learn what is the important audio information to assess similarity between songs? Question? What is delta MFCC? Yeah, so the delta, so MFCC is the melt frequency capsule coefficients. So you extract the spectrum and then you look at the spectrum of the spectrum. And the delta is that you look at the first and the second derivative as well. Okay. One thing that we also do is we do some kind of square rooting on this histogram. Um, I can talk more about this offline, why this is believed to be a good thing to do. But the bottom line here is, is that we extract some audio features. That's all that you, know, you should actually retain from this slide. The big challenge now is how can we build a learning system that picks up on the audio content that is important to assess similarity between songs. Okay, so here's the idea. So you have a whole set of training data, a whole set of songs, let's say a catalog of you know, 100,000 or 200,000 songs. If you just extract the raw audio features like we talked about in the previous slide, then you can represent all these songs in some you know, high dimensional space again, right? And now given a query song, because that's what I'm trying to do here, right? So given a query song, I want to recommend similar songs. So let's say that this guy here is my query song, and you can rank all the other songs according to their distance to the query song and use that as your recommended ranking, right? So what I would do is I would first recommend this one, then this one, then that one, and so on and so on. Now, since this is a training data set, I have some extra information about these songs. I have some extra information as to which of these songs are actually good recommendations and which ones are bad ones. This is just a conceptual example, but as it turns out, all these songs are actually good recommendations and all these guys are bad recommendations. I happen to know this information again because this is going to be a training data set to train my system later on, right? So if I now do this, if I implement the ranking mechanism as I just talked about, then what you'll see is that you're actually ranking or you're recommending songs from the most relevant to the least relevant one here, which is actually a mixture of good and bad hits if you recommend songs based on distance in this space. Everybody following? All right, now, so what, what I would like to do here is I would like to somehow learn a transformation W of this space that reorganizes the space in a way that it generates better rankings. And in fact, what this transformation is going to do is it's somehow going to define a projection between this space and that space that projects out the useful audio information, right? And throws away the audio information that's not useful to recommend similar songs, okay? So the goal here is, given a bunch of training data for which I know for, so for every query song, I can pick any of these songs as a query song. I know for each choice of query song which of the other songs are relevant or not. Right? I want to make sure that I learn a transformation of the space so that the rankings that come out by doing this distance-based ranking are optimized and rank all the relevant results above the irrelevant results. How do we do this? Well, the way it is is we formulate this as a machine learning problem where we learn the distance between the audio representations of the query and any song in the database as a Mahalanobis distance. So these, the Q and the X are the features that we extract, the audio features, and the W is basically the transformation that we learn, right? Now, okay, so how do we do this? How do we learn this W here? So this is where it gets a little bit more technical. There is no like, or I'm just gonna, you know, apply some, you know, simple learning technique here. It's actually a little bit more challenging than like, for example, a classification problem because dealing with rankings is dealing with combinatoric objects. And optimizing combinatoric objects is, is, can be a little bit more challenging than optimizing, for example, a classifier. Before I tell you how we're addressing this problem, one quick thing that I need to tell you, though, is 
this yellow box here, how do we get this information? How do we know for a given query sum in our training data set which ones are the relevant ones and which ones are the irrelevant ones, right? The way we do this is we're actually using collaborative filtering data here. Because remember, if we have collaborative filtering data available, it's pretty much the best data to go from to make recommendations. And basically what we're doing here is we're gonna define the similarity between two songs A and B as the number of users that they share. Make sense? Now of course that means that we have to have user information about these two songs. So what we're going to do is we're going to constrain our training data set to a set of songs for which we have passive listening information. In our case here, we're mining that information from last event for roughly about, uh, I think, 5,000 or 10,000 songs over 300,000 users. Okay? So we define the similarity between two songs in our training data set as the number of users that they share normalized by, of course, the total number of users for each of the songs, some type of popularity metric. And so, of course, there is many different ways that we could define what is relevant and irrelevant for a given query song in our training data set. But what I think is nice about using collaborative filtering similarity is that number one, it's certainly a similarity measure that most people would agree on is very relevant. Again, if 10,000 people share these two songs in their playlist, they're probably good recommendations for each other. You can passively collect this data, and also you avoid any type of subjective discussions about genres and things like that. Because sometimes people say like, well, you can define similarity by just looking at genre tags. If those both are rock songs, they're similar. If they're not, then you know they're dissimilar. But then you get into the whole discussion as to like what exactly is a rock song, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it turns out that this actually works well in practice as well in some other um, experimental frameworks. But now back to the technical side of the story here. So we have our training data set. We have defined how we um, define similarity between all these songs in our training data set based on the last of them collaborative filtering data. So now we have to somehow learn this transformation to arrange these songs in that space in such a way that it leads to good recommendations. Or differently said, we have to learn which audio features are important to recommend songs and which ones are not. To do this, we, we use something that is called structural SVM. Now, SVM, or support vector machine, is a fairly well-known, or very well-known, in fact, um, machine learning technique for classification. Um, now, how many here have heard of support vector machines? Okay, cool. Very good. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we're using some type of extension of the support vector machine. In a support vector machine, you're given some description of a data item, and you're trying to predict whether it is black or white, right? Class plus one or class minus one. Here in this case, it's a little bit more complicated. The structural SVM will allow us to provide an input into the system, which could be a query song, for example. And as the output provides something that is much more complicated than just a binary class label. It could be a multi-class label, you know, membership to one of 10 classes, or it could even be a ranking, which is what we're after specifically here, a ranking of all our songs in the training data set, right? So going from SVM to structural SVM means that now we can predict with structural SVM much more complicated output structures. How does this work? Well, if you remember an SVM learns some vector W, right? And then it multiplies this W with the description of the input for which I'm trying to make a prediction. And then once it computes that inner product, it'll basically threshold the inner product to see whether it's positive or negative and make a decision as to whether that um, input belongs to one class or the other. Here in this case, the same thing happens. We're going to learn some vector w, but now instead of multiplying it just with a description of the input, we're going to multiply it with a feature map that measures the similarity between my input q and any possible prediction y that we could see at the output of our system. A little bit more complicated, and the way that the prediction is done is by maximizing this expression with respect to y. So basically the y that maximizes this expression is the y that's going to be predicted for a certain input q to the system. Right? Now you may say like, well, that's, that's kind of like a difficult way to do prediction because now I have to optimize over all possible rankings here given an input query to figure out what's the good ranking of all songs given, you know, an input query. It turns out that for some choices of this side function here, there's some simple ways to do this optimization. For example, by ranking all the items in my database according to some inner product function, W transpose phi, where this is some type of similarity function between the input query and any other item in my database. Now, this is getting a little bit too technical. The high level message here is, is that instead of using SVMs, we can use these structural SVMs that allow us to predict rankings 
And what's core and central to um, this algorithm is this type of inner product between a vector w that is learned during the training process and some feature map between input queries and output rankings. That's the most important part of the message here. For the rest, everything looks identical to normal support vector machines. What we do is we impose some margin constraints to say that good results should be leading to higher scores than bad results, right? Because remember, it is what maximizes this expression here that's going to be our output prediction. So basically, similar to the margin constraints of a regular SVM, we're going to say that good rankings have to lead to a score that is much better than the score for bad rankings with some margin delta, which depends on how bad the bad ranking really is and some slight variable here. And then if we take these constraints and we throw that into an optimization problem that looks very much like the standard SVM optimization problem with some regularization term or a margin term here and an error term, and basically we have the formulation of a structural SVM. In summary, this thing, solving this thing here, allows, allows us to build a support vector machine that can predict rankings instead of binary class labels. Okay. Now, why am I talking about this? Well, the reason why I'm talking about this is because you should remember one thing here, which is this type of inner product between some W and some interesting function between the query and the ranking. If we just remember that part, and we go back to the problem that we're trying to solve, which is optimizing this W transformation matrix here to learn this Mahalanobis distance between sums, then we said that what we would do is we would rank sums by sorting them in descending order by the negative Mahalanobis distance, right? Ranking by increasing distance or, you know, ranking by decreasing negative distance. If you look at the expression for the distance here, then you can actually do a little bit of matrix algebra on that. And you can write it as the trace of the matrix W times this expression here. As it turns out, the trace is known to represent an inner product in matrix space. This is a matrix here, and as it turns out, this is a matrix of rank 1, which depends on the input query and any item in my database that I want to rank. So basically, if you look at this thing here, it actually describes to me an inner product between a matrix W and some function between the query and the items in my database that I'm interested to rank. So the only message I'm trying to give away here is that the structural SVM framework, which uses a score function that looks pretty much like this, but works on vectors rather than matrices, if we can extend that framework from learning a vector W to a matrix W, then we can actually apply it to learn the optimal transformation here. Okay, I'm putting a lot of math under the carpet, but I hope that you know two little bits kind of came through here, which is one, structural SVM is a very interesting framework to, be, to deal with prediction problems that are using more structured outputs than binary class labels. And as it turns out, we can use this framework to work here if we extend it to matrix algebra rather than vector algebra to learn transformation that we're interested in. And without going into any further detail, this is how it looks mathematically. It doesn't really matter at this point. The only thing I want to say is that it actually allows us to optimize rankings according to a whole suite of typical ranking loss functions that are user information retrieval. Not only area under the curve, but also things like MAP, MDCG, which a lot of search engines try to optimize, precision at K, etc., etc. So that's one of the nice things. So a lot of these combinatoric ranking, uh, ranking losses to optimize rankings can actually be plugged into this problem, and we can still solve the problem in reasonable time, because what we're going to do is we're going to use a cut and plane technique to solve this problem for a subset of the constraints. Because as you remember, what this constraint says is that every good ranking has to be have a better score than every bad ranking. Of course, there's exponentially many, many of those, right? And so what we have to do is we have to somehow kind of cut that exponential set of constraints down to a smaller set. And hopefully by solving the optimization problem with the smaller set, we get still the optimal solution. And that's what the cutting plane technique will do for us. We have also moved beyond this in many different ways to try to solve this problem. Um, is the battery gone? Yeah. Time is gone. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 Maybe Should I? Okay, if you could learn, just be longer. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I can. I can. Yeah. So, um, let's see, where was I? So anyway, so this is the optimization problem. You solve this and boom, comes out W. Okay. So now the question is, does this really help us? 
by solving this mathematical problem, getting out W and basically extracting the audio features that are important to assess similarity. Okay, what are we looking at here? The green, so on the vertical axis are different approaches. The horizontal axis is performance, where this is low, this is high. Okay? The green approaches here are approaches that use tags. Remember, that was our original technique, right? The blue approaches here are approaches that use audio features. Now, the approaches that are circled here are the two approaches that use tags and audio features without any learning. So just raw distance between tag vectors, raw distance between audio features. And as you can see, assessing similarity between songs based on tags does better than assessing similarity based on raw audio features. This is just less robust, more noisy. However, if we do learn which are the most relevant features to assess similarity based on the framework that I just presented, and the order between these methods turns around. Both methods improve performance, which is a good thing. We're learning something. But in the case of tags, the performance increases to a level that is lower than the performance that we can get by optimizing the audio features to assess similarity between songs. Okay? So initially we thought that we couldn't really improve using raw audio features, but then by designing this technique here, we found out that using this learning algorithm will allow us to use audio features to build, for example, a radio station that gives us high, higher quality recommendations than using these tag vectors. Of course, then now the question is, how can you still improve on what we have? Because as you can see here, there's still you know, a nice bit to go here to get all the way to 100% performance. So one of the ways that you could possibly think about improving this is by looking into nonlinear transformations. The transformation we looked at right now was just you know, a linear multiplication with a matrix W which is basically equivalent to saying that I'm going to take my data, I'm going to pro project it with a projection matrix N, and then I'm learning the inner product matrix of that projection matrix N. That's pretty much what I'm doing. But what you could also do is you could say like, well, instead of doing the projection of X directly on X, I'm first going to map my data into some high dimensional feature space in some nonlinear way, and then learn the projection from that space. That's something that people typically do in kernel-based learning methods. And that will allow us to look into nonlinear mappings, for example. But one other thing which I think is actually much more promising to try to improve the performance of the system is the following. Oh, is that, is that, is that me? Yes, no, no. that works fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I thought somebody was doing something upstairs. <laughs> So last push of the day here, we talked about using tags to assess similarity between songs, right? We talked about using these audio waveforms here. The question is, how can we improve things? Well, one way that we could try to improve things is, instead of using just that, or it's just, instead of using just that, why don't we use both of them? Why don't we use and the waveform and the tags? That would be one possible way to try to improve the system, right? Now, in fact, there is one more step that we could very easily consider as well, because as it turns out, most artists that upload songs to their MySpace profiles, for example, as unknown as they are, most of the time there's a couple pictures there. Most of the time there is some people that they're related to on MySpace, and some other information possibly, like their biography. So the bottom line is, is that most of the time, even for the very unknown songs, there is some extra information available about those songs, like social connectivity, like videos, images, or things like that. For the slightly more, well, more well-known bands, we may have some information um, on a web blog, et cetera, et cetera, that describe the songs the artist generates. But the bottom line is, is that often we have other information available than just the waveform, so why not use it, okay? So the idea here now is how can we use all this information together to improve music recommendations? And in fact, not just using other content then audio content would help us, but possibly also exploring other audio features would be a very obvious way to try to improve the system. I didn't talk much about that, but as I said to you probably about 15 minutes ago, the audio features that we're extracting here, they're not entirely random. I mean, they're audio features that have proven good performance for music, but they're also far from you know, the optimal choice. 
So how do we do this? How can we somehow use all these different variations of features and content modalities now to improve music recommendations? Well, somehow you may say, like, well, we can do the exact same thing as what we did before. Rather than just extracting a vector of audio features, now we're going to extract a vector of all kinds of audio features and visual features and all kinds of stuff, and we're going to run the same machine learning algorithm, right? But the problem is that if you do that, you ignore the fact that these different features actually live in different feature spaces, that they may be normalized in different ways, that some of them are visual, other ones are audio features. So it's actually better to represent all these features into different feature spaces, and then initially at least deal with these different feature spaces independently before throwing things together. Okay. Now one of the ways, of course, to do this is by just ignoring my suggestion here and just say I'm going to concatenate everything and go from there. But again, as I said, that has you know, certain uh, dangers uh, or, or risks related to it, so we're not going to do that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to learn weights for each of these feature spaces, and that will help us to basically downward weight the feature spaces that don't contain very useful information and up weight the feature spaces that do contain useful information. Okay, and there's different ways that you can formulate this as a mathematical learning problem. One of them is by appealing to this kernel-based learning framework, which then results in something that's known as multiple kernel learning. Um, I don't have time to go into detail about this here, but this is pretty much the gist of what this does. It weighs individually different feature spaces depending on their relevance to the learning problem here, in this case, music similarity. But of course, one thing you may say is like, well, you know, if I'm just going to learn one weight for each of these feature spaces, I'm either able to collapse them or upweight them. But that's all I can do. It may be that some part of this feature space is useful and another part is not. And so I'm not capturing that type of information. So instead, what we can do is instead of learning weights for each of these feature spaces, we could learn projection matrices for each of these feature spaces individually. So basically, what we're doing now is we're Instead of what we did 10 slides ago, which is learning one projection matrix for one feature space, we're now learning multiple projections for multiple feature spaces in parallel. And hooray, hooray, it turns out that mathematically we can formulate this as a problem that can still be solved in polynomial time, which is a good thing. All right, so setting here is we learn multiple projections for multiple feature spaces, and these different feature spaces are related to different audio features, to visual features, and all kind of information that we may be able to extract to do music recommendation. Does this improve things or not? Well, I can't really tell you yet because we're still implementing this. We have implemented it for some related problems, a related music recommendation problem where it did improve the recommendation last year, and also several problems in uh, computer vision related to object recognition. Okay, the reason why we started solving these type of problems is because the data was just a little bit more easily available than the music data that I just talked about. So currently, we're trying to use this on music data, and hopefully it'll improve recommendation. Now, to just stop now with a very kind of uh, futuristic view about how I see that music recommendation may evolve from here, is uh, the following um, kind of uh, use case. So we have this person here that would like to listen to some music, and so like you know, they go for a run, they would like to listen to a certain type of music, they still have to either use a search engine and type in what they want, or they have to provide some seed songs to generate the playlist that they may be interested in. Right? What I'm thinking is that to really build a system that people will use at a much larger scale, we should try to avoid all of this here, because some people are not very comfortable with typing in what they want, and some of them don't actually have much music on their phone that they could use as a seed song as they're you know, about to take off for running. So the idea here is, is, could we possibly automate this? Could we possibly allow the system, or build a system that doesn't require any clicks from the user? One of the ways to do that would be to look at a whole bunch of the sensors that are available in smartphones, and try to use these sensors to figure out what the user is doing, or how the user is feeling, and basically adapt the radio station to either the activity or the mood of the user in a dynamic way so that you don't require them anymore to say what they feel like listening to or provide seed songs. You may say like, well, okay, that's kind of an interesting idea, but this is gonna be a heck of a, a job to implement this, right? Now, as it turns out, interesting, this phone has, let's say, 20 sensors. Each of these sensors generates a signal, right? Now, that each of these signals is what? It's a one-dimensional time series. So, oh, wait a sec. We have a black box that can automatically annotate one-dimensional time signals, right? 
So we can actually use the music annotation machinery now to automatically annotate sensor signals from the phone. <laughs> of course, it doesn't really make sense to annotate these sensor signals with genres and things like that, so we're mostly focusing on emotion tags and usage tags now. But once we've done that, once we have used these algorithms to automatically annotate the sensor signals from the phone with usage tags and emotion tags, we can then match those tags against the tags that we have for the songs in our database and recommend the songs that are hopefully good matches for what people are feeling or doing. Of course, you could also even think like, yeah, why not, you know, kind of associate genre tags to these accelerometers as well. I mean, it doesn't seem to make much sense, but maybe it can, you know, improve the system, who knows? Those are some kind of interesting directions to explore. Right now, the direction that we're mostly exploring is, we kind of, we, we haven't given up on it. We have just said like, well, emotion is probably a little bit harder to predict, so let's focus first on usage. And so right now, we're actually building a system that um, uses our machinery to predict the activity of what a person is doing, and then matches it against uh, song recommendations in an automatic way so people don't have to see the system. Of course, they still have to provide thumbs up and thumbs down because you know some songs are songs that some people like and other people don't like. And then we use that type of feedback to improve our recommendation system. But the bottom line is, is that we now have a system that can actually, uh, or we have built a system that is aimed to detect what a person is doing and then generate playlists based on that. Okay. And I guess this is the right time to say that this is what I talked about, and this is the people I should thank for that. Thank you. I guess we have some time for questions. Yeah, I actually have a quick question. So in the beginning of the slide, you mentioned about um, before feeding the songs to the black box uh, so that you can auto-tag all the songs, right? You have to train data for each tag, a uh, rock, uh, romance, alternative, whatnot. How often do you train uh, the tags in the visual tags? That's a very good question. Um, so right now, we have not um, actively um, made these models dynamic, like we don't make them automatically update themselves based on the data that's being collected from her. This is just a small step that we just have to take and, and do it. I mean, actually, we do, we do do it. During the active training, we keep, you know, dynamically updating them. But this was more motivated by, you know, the active learning part, not really by, you know, we want to keep models up to date, you know, every, you know, seven days per hour search engine. So we're, we're not, it's, 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 it's a very small thing that is just a matter of, you know, an implementation of that we have to turn in a couple hours. Um, but the reason why I'm, you know, giving you a longer answer um, is because I think it's a very interesting question because if you think about, for example, the setup that Pandora has, a lot of the songs in their database have been tagged by people five years ago or six or seven years ago, right? And um, so they're still using that same data to make recommendations right now. One of the advantages, I think, from having um, a game like Herdit to collect the data is that if there's new words that pop up, or if the meaning of certain words and how they're associated with music changes over time, then the game will actually pick up on it. We will see that people are making different types of associations. So from that perspective, the answer to your question is that we have to do that. We have to dynamically update our models to take advantage of that. Right? It's right. just that the current search engine that we have, which I showed you a slide of, we just haven't done that. Yes, but it's it's just a matter of, you know, it's a small push to make it happen. Because the reason why I ask that is because the idea of what a romantic song might be changes with time as well. Correct, yeah, exactly. That's exactly these, the case. Days, the idea of a romantic song could be uh, yeah. Lady Gaga or Chemical Romance, <laughs> but you ask a much older person for a friend. Yeah, so there's two dimensions to this, right? So one dimension is a demographic dimension where, you know, different demographics may think differently about what a romantic song is. But then the other dimension, and you're right on, is that this may change in time. Even if you look at the average user, what the average user thinks is romantic now may be very different in 10 years from now. And so we do collect that as training data. It's now just a matter of feeding that training data every seven days into our updated models and linking those updated models to the search engine page that we have. That's just you know the one small thing that we should just add. There's no good excuse for not having done it, but I'm just giving you an honest answer. <laughs> Question. Does Herdit deal with adversarial users or groups of adversarial users? That's a good question. We don't. So right now we don't. Um, so, well, okay. Let's maybe we don't consciously um, 
deal with them like in terms of trying to detect them, but the methods we use to extract data from herded do use a little bit of statistical modeling. And we believe that that statistical modeling will filter out most of the adversar adversarial users. But it's not that we have tried to really like look where they are and then see how much they affect the data. We haven't done that. The only guarantee that we have right now that our technique possibly use, uh, works well is that we get up to the performance of a system trained on Pandora tags within you know, 3 to 4%. Um, but that's, that's a good question, especially like with Mechanical Turk, for example. This is something you have to really uh, try to catch those people because they may kind of you know, give you a high volume of data and then cost you money. Here, in this case, we don't really care about that. We can just throw away the data. But even without throwing it away, which is what we're doing now, we're still getting data that allows us to train the system um, up to you know, 96% per percent per performance of the expert system. So, question? You, you talked about uh, rock, but does this actually generalize as well as to these 20 inputs from the phone and can be used to speech or other types of music? Yeah, so what's interesting is that the, the machine learning system that's behind it, um, which is um, you know, kind of a, um, the, the, the simple version of it I, I presented here with these you know, mixtures of Kalman filters, we also use mixtures of Gaussian and stuff like that. So that system by itself, in principle, can be used for anything. It can be used for speech. Some pe people have used it for speech, like the mixtures of Gaussian, for example. Um, it could be used for um, you know, modeling accelerometer signals, for music, for sound effects. We use it for that too. Um, so these models are very generic. Um, you know, the, 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 the big thing is, what, what this is a typical thing about machine learning. So th there's two stages in the machine learning system, right? So first stage is always feature extraction. The second stage is a learning algorithm. The second stage, the learning algorithm is very often generally applicable, whether you want to apply it to computer vision, music, web search, anything, you know? What makes or breaks a machine learning algorithm, this is very well known, whether it is in music or in vision or any other field, what makes or breaks it is the feature extraction stage. A lot of progress has been made in computer vision in the past you know, 10, 15 years, for example, in object recognition, because people have done a tremendous effort on extracting you know, a variety of features, and they're starting to converge on which features are giving them the best information. If you extract features that have information, then machine learning algorithms will get it out. So to answer your question, we can use these algorithms as well to you know, classify accelerometer signals, but the big challenge will be the extraction of features from these accelerometer signals. You know, you can do like, well, you can say, we're gonna just use everything we have and just extract NFCCs and ignore you know, this whole feature selection stage or the feature extraction stage, um, or the fact that accelerometer signals are different from music signals. And then it actually turns out that you don't get too bad performance. So just extracting music features from the accelerometer signal as if it was music. But there is improvement possible there, and I think the way to improve from, I think roughly, we're at about 80% performance doing that right now. I think for activities, you can get close to 100%. It's not subjective. Like a person is either sitting or walking. They're driving or biking, you know? And so I think that 20% gap, the way to close that is to not just extract MFCCs from an accelerometer signal, but extract you know, something that's more appropriate and integrate it with all the other Single as well. I just, just to, um, I lost you a little bit there on the structured SVM, mm -hmm. but it, it seemed like um, you were using the SVM as part of uh, an objective function, where you're optimizing over multiple kernels to get to some, to to, to get to. Um, Wait, should I go back to the slides? Would that be helpful? I'm not even. Um, yeah, I think that might be helpful. Let's see. I was just, I was just trying to understand why. Um, Line this one here. Was yeah. That? Is that is that what's happening, or maybe? Oh, maybe this one. That's the structural SVM. The, okay. That's that's the plain vanilla structural SVM, and then two slides further is the one that the matrix version that we are implementing. And your question was. And I was just trying to understand when, when you're. It sounded like you were going from an SVM to a structural SVM because you want to go from a traditional just basic classifier to something that would give you ranking, yeah. right? Yeah. And. Um, and I was just trying to understand how you're doing that. Were you, are you basically creating an optimization over multiple kernels? No, so here, okay, to extend the traditional SVM to um, an algorithm that can predict rankings, 
right? What you need to do now is so you need to the first thing you need to change is you need to change the prediction machinery, right? So to make a prediction in a classical SVM, you have this weight factor that you learn. You multiply it with you know your input features, and that in a product will tell you whether it's a plus one or a minus one, right? Now here you want to use something that you learned, which is again a W vector, and you want to somehow combine it with your input, with input which is Q now. But now you want this to not spit out plus one or minus one, but to spit out an entire ranking. So how do you do that? Well, the way we do this is we are making the prediction part of this inner product through this feature map psi, which is somehow like you could say some type of like similarity function between the input query Q and a predicted ranking Y. Now, this inner product here, so once you have learned the structure as the M, you know W, for a given input, you know Q, right? So now you can optimize this over Y. And the way that the prediction works is that for a given Q, the Y that optimizes this inner product here is considered as the prediction, the predicted ranking, or the, the, the optimal predicted ranking, so to speak, for the query Q. So the prediction works a little bit different. It's not just computing an inner product, it's optimizing an inner product over all possible outputs, which could possibly be a very intensive task, right? Because there's exponentially many here. And so in some cases, there's actually ways that you could make that computation a lot more efficient, um, depending on the choice of this function of psi here, right? So that's the first thing. So the difference going from SVM to structural SVM, the prediction mechanism changes. But the optimization problem that we're using is actually fairly similar. All the optimization problem does is it optimizes this W with like a similar type of margin term with some error term in here. And now the crucial constraint here is a constraint that says that the score, so for a given input query Q, and we're gonna do this for all input queries Q that we could ever consider, right? It says that the score for the optimal ranking YQ that we would love to see associated with Q should be bigger than the score for any other ranking Y in the set of all possible permutations of the elements of my data set, right? And this should be bigger than that by some margin where, of course, the margin depends on how bad Y really is. Like if this is a really bad prediction, then there should be a big margin. If not, then it could be a smaller margin. And then here is this error term, right? So that's basically how it generalizes. So SVM generalizes to structural SVM by this. All the rest is the same thing. If this was a regular SVM, this would be W transpose X, right? And so what we do now is when we generalize this, we generalize this to an optimization problem where we're now optimizing this over a matrix W that is positive semi-definite. But it's not just like throwing W and it'll work. It's just there's, there's a whole mathematical interpretation that happens on the back end. Why this actually does what we want it to do. So I didn't have much time to go into that detail, but I thought it was still interesting for you guys to hear a little bit about structural SVM and SVMs that can make predictions that are you know, more complex than just binary classifications. Okay, there is no multiple kernels here yet. The time that we get into multiple kernels is right here when we're actually looking at different feature spaces with different projections. And then we're learning all these projections in parallel with each other from feature spaces which could be defined after a nonlinear transformation of the input information. And so then what you end up in here is then you end up in feature spaces here that are defined by inner product matrices or kernel matrices. Right. And so then you get an optimization problem like this one here where there's kernel matrices in here, there's a bunch of W's in there, a bunch of, um, where is it? Well, I didn't even put that constraint in here. Um, there's a bunch of, oh, here there are, a bunch of uh, uh, positive semi-definite constraints on all the W's for all these different spaces, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then at this point here, you go from structural SVM to the matrix version to the multiple matrix version, which is then, you know, multiple kernel uh, embedding. Does that somehow answer that question? That helps a lot. Two guys, I would suggest uh, Gert will be around, so because some people might be uh, might have to run now because it's their lunch break. So let's thank Gert again. Thank you. Feel free to stick around and check with Gert. Um, also, we have uh, some announcements to make. So, the first one, I know that Rob has some announcements to make. And also, here at uh, eHarmony, we will have a Santa Monica Java user group. And uh, Kevin Hansen from 10 Gen will be coming to talk about MongoDB. That will be April the 5th uh, in, at 7 p.m. here. So, you guys can again find some details on the meetup. And uh, Rob has some announcements for future. All right, so four announcements to make. Uh, one is there's going to be a social dynamics 
workshop in Anaheim in a bunch of months. Should be fairly interesting. It's going to talk about a lot of data and social context, and they're also looking for sponsor sponsors. Second, um, there's going to be a there's going to be a summer school at UCLA on deep learning. So if you have any interest in that, sign up. Uh, come to me. I'll give you the link. But you can find it's going to be it's going to be a summer school on deep learning and feature learning, Android and all those. Uh, going to be there. Um, Third thing is looking for speakers for May and June. I just want to, I just want to remind again. And of course, the last thing, no bunch of you know about my machine learning class. If you didn't want to write an email and you have a questions for me to ask in person, I am here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we should thank our speaker one more time. <laughs> Also, don't forget to grab some puzzles over there if you don't have them.